Good morning. It, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Sandeep Jahar. He is uh, currently an associate professor of medicine at the relatively new Zucker Hofstra School of Medicine. Uh, I remember Hofstra well when I was growing up in Queens. At that time, it was a very small <laughs> college. Now it's grown dramatically, and it's a full university. Sandeep is recognized internationally and nationally uh, as a physician author. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. But first, to just uh, for many of you uh, who may not remember, New Haven has uh, been a fountainhead of physician authors, having two of the greatest uh, of such in the past uh, 50 years, namely uh, my good friend, the late Shep Newland, the National Book Award winner, who uh, wrote his uh, first major book, How We Die, uh, on a sabbatical when he was 60 years old and uh, won the National Book Award, continued uh, as an author for the rest of, of his life. Uh, an incredible man, a great mentor to many, including myself, and the late Dick Seltzer, who was also an acknowledged uh, wonderful author. Now, Sandeep uh, uh, has uh, a stellar and amazing career. Uh, I noted in his CV that he, he's been writing op-eds and essays in the New York Times for about 20 years, which is quite remarkable, uh, all the while uh, being a medical trainee and now, since 2004, director of the heart failure program uh, at uh, Long Island Jewish North Shore. Uh, he had his undergraduate degree at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, with a major in physics, then went on to get an MA and a PhD in physics at Berkeley uh, before he decided uh, on medical school at Wash U, uh, house staff training at New York Hospital Cornell uh, in New York City, uh, and then cardiology training uh, at uh, my old home, Bellevue, NYU, uh, where he then uh, uh, when he concluded his training, uh, joined uh, the, the faculty and staff at, at LIJ. Uh, in addition to uh, his many essays, uh, he has written three uh, books which have been translated into many languages and he's won many awards. The first book was published in 2008 called Intern. The second, uh, Doctored. Uh, which appeared in 2014 and in 2018, his latest book, uh, which is called Heart, A History. I've read two and I uh, commend them to you. You'll find them very enjoyable. So uh, he continues his career as a writer and as a physician and as a heart failure transplantation specialist. And uh, that's a lot to occupy uh, the routine 28-hour day. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure then to, to welcome Sandeep to the podium. The title of his talk is The Emotional Heart. Sandeep, welcome to New Haven. Thank you so much for that gender, generous inter introduction. Um, so this is my first time at Yale, so I'm, I'm very pleased, honored to be here. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I really appreciate the hospitality of the folks who took me out to dinner last night. Um, so, so I want to thank you for that. You know, um, so I was uh, chatting with Barry a little bit before. Uh, and so I, I figured I, I'll start a little informally talking about uh, the book uh, that I've written, um, it's called Heart and History, a little bit about why I wrote the book, um, and then I'll uh, deliver some prepared comments uh, and then take questions, and in the question and answer period, maybe we can talk a little bit about, well, whatever, uh, about the book, about writing in general, um, uh, whatever you want. So, uh, so I'll start off by just talking a little bit about uh, heart, 
So, you know, I, I wrote the book, uh, this is my third book. I, I wrote it for probably you know, uh, a few reasons. W one is that uh, I have a malignant family history of heart disease. Perhaps some of you do too. Um, a lot of people do. Uh, and uh, in my case, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather died uh, of a sudden heart attack uh, in 1953, 15 years before I was born. I never met him. Uh, he actually died in the presence of my father. They were having lunch, and he slumped to the floor, went unconscious, and died. And like many people who have experienced the sudden death of a loved one, uh, my father never got over it. Uh, there was a sort of grief that suffused his life, his adult life, and by extension was in our home. Um, you know, this, this sense that when I was growing up, you know, just this idea that you could be healthy and die. To me, that just, as a kid, just didn't make any sense. Didn't, didn't seem fair. Uh, and so I became a little obsessed with the heart because you know, the heart is really the only organ that can facilitate a sudden death um, uh, you know, w within a matter of minutes. And, and so, uh, so you know, I would uh, lie in bed uh, looking up at the ceiling fan and sort of time the rotations of the fan with my heartbeat. Uh, I would listen to uh, you know, my, my heart, my pulsations in my, in my, you know, in my ear. I mean, it, it was, it, it, you know, I, I the, just the, the, the whole idea of the heart uh, as this life-sustaining force um, was uh, all-consuming. My mother took advantage of this fact. She would say things like, you know, stop fighting with your brother or your dad will develop heart failure. Uh, so, no, she was a wonderful mother. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so, so that was one of the reasons why I became interested in, in the heart as an organ and then eventually um, as a subject to which I would de devote my professional life. Uh, the other reason I wanted to write the book is that I still find just the mechanics of the heart so fascinating. Uh, you know, the heart is really the most amazing machine that nature has devised. Uh, and you know, I don't need to tell a room full of cardiologists about how amazing it is, uh, but I, I still find it uh, almost fantastic that the heart can beat three billion times in a typical human lifetime. Uh, and that the work that it performs uh, would, for example, empty a swimming pool within a week. Uh, I mean, just the amount of work that it does is, is mind-boggling. And at the same time, there's a tension between its force, its strength, and the fact that it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable to sudden stoppage. And by extension, that makes us vulnerable uh, to sudden death. And, and that has really uh, been a fear, uh, been uh, something that I've thought about for much of my life. Uh, the third reason I decided to write the book uh, is that the history of heart discovery is absolutely amazing. It's, it's fascinating. And I didn't quite realize this when I started writing the book. But during the course of the research, I came across so much fascinating uh, history, uh, so many fascinating characters. And that really um, was eye-opening for me. You know, for much of my training, as many of you might uh, agree, you know, we didn't talk a lot about how we got to this point. What's the history of our field? And, I came to learn some fascinating things. For example, uh, some of you might already know that the heart was never operated on, at least in any kind of controlled way, until the late 19th century. Every other organ had been operated on, including the brain, but not the heart. 
Uh, and, you know, for us, it's pretty obvious uh, why that is. <clears throat> the heart is always moving. It's very hard to surgically manipulate something that's constantly moving. Uh, the heart is also filled with blood. So if you cut it open to repair a defect, the patient would bleed to death. If you stop the heart, empty it of blood uh, to prevent exsanguination, uh, the patient would develop massive organ damage, fatal organ damage, within five minutes or so. So there are tremendous obstacles, sort of biological obstacles, to manipulating the heart that other organs don't seem to have. Uh, now we know that the way to do that is through the heart-lung machine. And uh, the history of that discovery, that invention, was, is absolutely fascinating in its own right. But what I found even more fascinating was uh, the ways in which doctors and surgeons tried to circumvent this problem before the machine was developed. Uh, for example, the cross-circulation technique of Walt Lillehei. Uh, some of you probably know about it already, but uh, Lillehei uh, was a surgeon in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, uh, in the 50s and 60s uh, before moving to New York. Uh, I, I, I've spoken to many cardiac surgeons who say he was probably the most innovative surgeon of the 20th century. Uh, he won pr pretty much every prize except the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, he was really instrumental in developing not just surgical techniques, but also the first pacemaker, um, or his team was. But the, the story of cross-circulation is that uh, Lillehei and his team thought about fetal physiology. Now, of course, uh, during pregnancy, a fetus doesn't breathe, right? It's floating in amniotic fluid. So the fetus receives nourishment, oxygen, from the, mother, from the maternal blood supply and has waste ferried out of its body by that same blood supply. So Lillehei reasoned, well, why can't I use an adult, a parent of a child who needs uh, a cardiac defect repaired and hook them up artery to artery, vein to vein, just like in maternal circulation? And, uh, and in the process, stop the child's heart and repair it. You might not be surprised that people were absolutely aghast at that idea. Uh, it was, people said, the first surgery in human history that could kill two people. And, uh, but Lilhai uh, soldiered on. He was a very interesting character. He, he had uh, cancer uh, when he... He developed a sort of lymphoma when he was an, a resident. And actually, the story is that, that his uh, surgical chief knew about his lymphoma a couple of months before Lillehei did, before he told Lillehei, because he wanted him to finish his residency. He had a lymphosarcoma of the neck and uh, the head and neck. And then the chief operated on Lillehei after his residency and uh, did a sort of massive uh, operation, uh, removed all the malignancy. But there was this danger of death. That particular lymphosarcoma had a 50% five-year survival back then. And so Lillehei spent most of his professional life uh, under the specter of death. And so, he took chances, took risks that uh, a lot of other surgeons didn't take. Uh, he wanted to solve the conundrum of, uh, of open heart surgery. And uh, in, in many ways, he did. His cross-circulation technique, he used it 45 times with 28 long-term survivors, which was much better than the natural history of uh, congenital heart defects in the 1950s. So. Um, so those kinds of stories I came across, and I just found fascinating. I wanted to write about them. Finally, uh, the, the, probably the most uh, compelling reason for me to write the book is that the heart is just an object of cultural fascination. Uh, 
And uh, you know, it's historically been linked to uh, our emotional lives. And so there's this object that I sort of conceptualize as the metaphorical heart. And then there's this object that I work with and manipulate with medications every day that is the biological heart. And how are those two hearts connected? That was a question that I had uh, when I first started writing the book. And you know, is there a connection or, is, or, or not? And um, how that metaphorical heart intersects with the biological heart is a theme of the book. Uh, and it's also the theme of my talk. So I will uh, start with that and then uh, afterward take questions. No other organ, perhaps no other object in human life, is as imbued with metaphor and meaning as the human heart. Over the course of history, the heart has been a symbol of our emotional lives. It was considered by many to be the seat of the soul, the repository of the emotions. The very word emotion derives in part from the French verb émouvoir, meaning to stir up. And perhaps it's only logical that emotions would be linked to an organ characterized by its agitated movement. The symbolism of the emotional heart endures even today. If we ask people which image they most associate with love, there's no doubt that the Valentine heart would top the list. The heart shape is called a cardioid, and it's common in nature. It's found in the leaves, flowers, and seeds of many plants, including silphium, which was used for birth control in the early Middle Ages and maybe the reason why the heart became associated with sex and romantic love. Whatever the reason, hearts began to appear in paintings of lovers in the 13th century. Over time, the pictures came to be colored red, the color of blood, <clears throat> a symbol of passion. Later, heart-shaped ivy, reputed for its longevity and grown on tombstones, became an emblem of eternal love. In the Roman Catholic Church, the heart shape became known as the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Adorned with thorns and emitting ethereal light, it was an insignia of monastic love. This association between the heart and love has withstood modernity. When Barney Clark, a retired dentist with end-stage heart failure, received the first permanent artificial heart in Utah in 1982, his wife of 39 years reportedly asked the doctors, Will he still be able to love me? Today, we know that the heart is not the source of love or the other emotions per se. The ancients were mistaken. And yet, more and more, we've come to understand that the connection between the heart and the emotions is a highly intimate one. The heart does not originate our feelings, but it is highly responsive to them. In a sense, a record of our emotional life is written on our hearts. Fear and grief, for example, can cause profound cardiac injury. The nerves that control unconscious processes, such as the heartbeat, can sense distress and trigger a maladaptive fight or flight response that signals blood vessels to constrict, the heart to gallop, and blood pressure to rise, resulting in damage. In other words, it is increasingly clear that our hearts are extraordinarily sensitive to our emotional system, to the metaphorical heart, if you will. As most of you know, there's a heart disorder first recognized about two decades ago called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, or the broken heart syndrome, in which the heart acutely weakens in response to extreme stress or grief, such as after a romantic breakup or the death of a loved one. Patients develop symptoms that mimic those of a heart attack. They may develop chest pain and shortness of breath, even congestive heart failure. On an echocardiogram, the heart appears stunned frequently ballooning into the distinctive shape of a takasubo, a Japanese pot with a wide base and a narrow neck. Though we don't know exactly why this happens, the syndrome often resolves within a few weeks. However, in the acute period, it can cause heart failure, life-threatening arrhythmias, even death. For example, the husband of an elderly patient of mine had died two weeks prior. She was sad, of course, but accepting maybe even a bit relieved. It had been a long illness. He'd had dementia. But a week after the funeral, she looked at his picture and became tearful. And then she got chest pain. 
and with it came shortness of breath, distended neck veins, a sweaty brow, a noticeable panting as she was sitting up in a chair, all signs of congestive heart failure. She was admitted to the hospital where an echo confirmed what we already suspected. Her heart had weakened to less than half its normal function and had ballooned into the shape of a takasubo. But nothing on other tests was amiss. No sign of clogged arteries anywhere. Two weeks later, her emotional state had returned to normal, and so an ultrasound confirmed had her heart. Takasubo cardiomyopathy has been reported in many stressful situations, including public speaking, <laughs> gambling losses, domestic disputes, even a surprise birthday party. Outbreaks of it have even been associated with widespread social upheaval, such as after a natural disaster. For example, in 2004, a major earthquake devastated a district on the largest island in Japan. More than 60 people were killed and thousands were injured. On the heels of this catastrophe, researchers found that there was a 24-fold increase in the number of Takosubo cases in the district one month after the earthquake compared to a similar period the year before. The residences of these cases were closely correlated with the intensity of the tremor. In almost every case, patients lived near the epicenter. The broken heart syndrome has also been studied, studied in the United States. Scientists at the University of Arkansas identified almost 22,000 patients diagnosed with Takasubo cardiomyopathy in the US in 2011. The highest rate of cases, nearly triple the national average, was in Vermont where a tropical storm wreaked more damage that year than in nearly a century. The second highest rate was in Missouri, where a massive tornado ripped through the town of Joplin, killing at least 158 people. Though these geographic areas were not the only ones hit by natural disasters that year, the scientists noted that their populations were perhaps less prepared because of a lack of exposure to disasters and therefore more vulnerable to the ensuing distress. Interestingly, Takasubo cardiomyopathy can develop after a happy event too, but the heart appears to react differently. In some cases, ballooning in the mid portion, for instance, rather than at the apex. Now why different emotional precipitants would result in different cardiac changes remains a mystery. But today, perhaps as an ode to our ancient philosophers, we can acknowledge that even if our emotions are not contained inside our hearts, the biological heart overlaps its metaphorical counterpart in surprising and mysterious ways. Heart syndromes, including sudden death, have long been reported in individuals experiencing intense emotional disturbance or turmoil in their metaphorical hearts. For example, in 1942, the Harvard physiologist Walter Cannon published a paper called Voodoo Death, in which he described cases of death from fright in people who believed they had been cursed, such as by a witch doctor or as a consequence of eating taboo fruit. In some cases, the victim, all hope lost, dropped dead on the spot. What these deaths had in common was the victim's absolute belief that there was an external force that could cause their demise and against which they were powerless to fight. This perceived lack of control, Cannon postulated, resulted in an unmitigated physiological response in which blood vessels constricted to such a degree that blood volume acutely dropped, blood pressure plummeted, the heart acutely weakened, and massive organ damage resulted from a lack of transported oxygen. Cannon believed that voodoo deaths were limited to primitive people, quote, so superstitious, so ignorant that they feel themselves bewildered strangers in a hostile world. But over the years, these types of deaths have been shown to affect all manner of modern people too. Today, death by grief has been observed in spouses and in siblings. Broken hearts are literally and figuratively deadly. These associations hold true even for animals. For example, in a study in the journal Science, researchers fed caged rabbits 
a high cholesterol diet to study its effect on heart disease. Surprisingly, they found that some of the animals developed more heart disease, cardiovascular disease, than others, but they didn't know why. They thought it might have to do with how often the technician who delivered food interacted with the rabbits. So they repeated the study, dividing the rabbits into two groups. Both groups were fed a high cholesterol diet, but one group was removed from their cages, played with, petted, interacted with, talked to, and the other group remained in their cages, isolated, and were left alone. The first group on autopsy had 60% less aortic disease than the second, the one that was isolated, despite having comparable cholesterol levels, heart rate, and blood pressure. Consider another example, Japanese immigrants. Coronary artery disease is relatively rare in Japan. However, its rate is almost double in Japanese immigrants who settle in Hawaii and triple in those who settle in the mainland United States. Part of the explanation might be that Japanese immigrants adopt unhealthy American habits such as a sedentary lifestyle or a diet rich in processed foods. Still, traditional Framingham risk factors do not fully explain this disparity. In the early 1970s, Sir Michael Marmot and his colleagues at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health studied nearly 4,000 middle-aged Japanese men living in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area. They found that the immigrants who stayed true to their Japanese roots as evidenced in surveys by their ability to read Japanese, the frequency with which they spoke Japanese, the frequency with which they had Japanese coworkers, Japanese spouses, and so on. Had a, those, that group had a much lower prevalence of heart disease, even when they, were, when they matched Americans in terms of serum cholesterol and blood pressure, than immigrants who were more integrated into their new culture. Traditional Japanese immigrants had coronary disease rates in line with their mainland counterparts. Westernized immigrants had a prevalence that was at least three times higher. The researchers concluded, quote, retention of Japanese group relationships is associated with a lower rate of coronary heart disease. And so acculturation, they declared, is a major risk factor for coronary disease in immigrant populations. If cutting traditional cultural ties increases the risk of heart disease, then psychosocial factors must play a role in cardiovascular health. Today, we know this to be true in many strata of human society. For example, American blacks in poor urban centers have a much higher prevalence of hypertension and cardiovascular disease than other groups. Some have proposed genetics to be a deciding factor. However, this is unlikely, this is an unlikely explanation because American blacks have hypertension at much higher rates than their West African counterparts. Moreover, hypertension per pervades other segments of American society in which poverty and social ills are rampant. Peter Sterling, the University of Pennsylvania neurobiologist, has written that hypertension in such communities is a normal response to what he calls chronic arousal or stress. In small pre-industrial communities, he writes, people tend to know and trust one another. Generosity is rewarded. Cheating tends to be punished. When this milieu is disrupted, as in migration or urbanization, there is often an increased need for vigilance. People get estranged from their neighbors. Communities become diverse and more mistrustful. Physical and social isolation often results. Add in poverty, fragmented families, and joblessness, and you get extremely stress-prone populations. The chronic arousal triggers the release of hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol, that tighten blood vessels and cause retention of salt. These, in turn, lead to long-term changes like arterial wall thickening and stiffening 
that increase the blood pressure that the body tries to maintain. In Sterling's formulation, nothing is broken except perhaps the system. The body is responding exactly in the way it should to the chronic fight or flight circumstances in which it finds itself. If takosubo cardiomyopathy proves that acute psychological disruption can damage the heart, Sterling's theories suggest that chronic low-level stress may be just as harmful. His theories put psychosocial factors front and center in how we think about and approach heart problems. They show that chronic heart disease, unloosed from a Framingham cage, is inextricably linked to the state of our neighborhoods, jobs, and families. Heart disease in this conception is no longer strictly biological. It is cultural and political as well. Improving our social structures and relationships becomes not only a quality of life issue, but also a public health concern. The harmful cardiovascular effects of chronic arousal apply to traditionally white communities too. One example is the Whitehall study, also conducted by Marmot, of 17,000 male workers in the, British, in the British civil service. In this study, early death and poor health were found to increase stepwise from the highest to the, low, to the lowest levels of the civil service hierarchy. Messengers and porters had nearly twice the death rate of higher ranking administrators, even after accounting for differences in smoking, plasma cholesterol, blood pressure, and alcohol consumption. None of these civil servants were poor in the usual sense. They all enjoyed clean water, plenty of food, and proper toilet facilities. The main ways they differed were in occupational prestige, job control, and other gradients of the social hierarchy. Marmot and his co-workers concluded that emotional disturbance because of financial instability, time pressures, lack of advancement, and a general dearth of autonomy. I think I'm describing teaching hospitals today. <laughs> Drives much of the difference in survival. He writes, quote, both low-grade civil servant and slum dweller lack control over their lives. They do not have the opportunity to lead lives they have reason to value. In my new book, Heart of History, I describe how the care of the heart has become less the province of philosophers who dwelled on the heart's metaphorical meanings and more the concern of doctors like me, like you, wielding technologies that even a century ago, because of the heart's exalted status in human culture, were considered taboo. The great pioneers include Daniel Hale Williams, the African-American doctor who performed the world's first documented open heart surgery in Gilded Age Chicago, and Walt Lillehei, who connected a child circulatory system to a healthy parents, paving the way for the heart-lung machine. A common theme connecting such discoveries is the transformation of the human heart from an almost supernatural object imbued with metaphor and meaning into a machine that can be manipulated and controlled. But these manipulations, we now must understand, must be complemented by attention to the emotional life that the heart for thousands of years was believed to contain. Consider, for example, the Lifestyle Heart Trial published in the British journal The Lancet in 1990. 48 patients with moderate or severe coronary artery disease were randomly assigned to usual care or an intensive lifestyle that included a low-fat vegetarian diet, moderate aerobic exercise, group psychosocial support, and stress management. After a year, the lifestyle patients had a nearly 5% reduction in coronary plaque. Control patients, on the other hand, had an average 5% more coronary obstruction after one year and 28% after five years. They also had roughly double the rate of cardiac events, including heart attacks, bypass surgery, and cardiac-related deaths. Now here's an interesting fact. 
some patients in the control group, the author said, and, and I, I spoke to them, adopted diet and exercise plans that were almost as intense as those in the intervention group. However, their heart disease still progressed. Diet and exercise alone were not enough to facilitate coronary disease regression. At both one and five year follow-ups, stress management was more strongly correlated with reversal of coronary artery disease than exercise was. The lead author of the study said this, the need for connection and community often goes unfulfilled in our culture. We know that these things affect the quality of our lives, but they also affect our survival to a much larger degree than most people realize. Many studies have suggested that he is right. For example, patients who are depressed after a heart attack are several times as likely to die within six months as those who are not, irrespective of usual cardiac risk factors like high cholesterol, hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Menopausal women with no history of cardiovascular disease who expressed more hopelessness on a psychological questionnaire had more carotid artery thickening and an older vascular age than matched patients who felt good about their lives. Now, no doubt, many of these studies are small. And of course, correlation does not prove causation. It's certainly possible that stress leads to unhealthy habits, and that this is the real reason for the increased cardiovascular risk. But as with the association of smoking and lung cancer, when so many studies show the same thing, and there are mechanisms to explain a causal relationship. It seems capricious to deny that one probably exists. What many doctors have concluded is what I too have learned in my nearly two decades as a cardiologist. The emotional heart affects its biological counterpart in surprising and mysterious ways. And yet medicine today continues to conceptualize the heart simply as a machine. That conceptualization has had great benefits. Cardiology has undoubtedly been one of the greatest scientific success stories of the past 100 years. Heart transplants, bypass surgery, angioplasty, stents, pacemakers, defibrillators, all these things were discovered or invented after World War II. However, it's possible we've approached the limits of what scientific medicine can do to combat heart disease. Indeed, the rate of decline in cardiovascular mortality has slowed significantly in the past decade. An autopsy study suggests that 80% of Americans 16 to 64 years of age have at least the beginnings of coronary artery disease. We will need to shift to a new paradigm, I believe, one focused on prevention to continue to make the kind of progress to which we have become accustomed. In this paradigm, psychosocial factors will need to be front and center in how we think about health problems. Despite the centuries-old association of the heart with the emotions, this is still a domain that remains largely unexplored. For example, the American Heart Association still does not list emotional stress as a key modifiable risk factor for heart disease, perhaps in part because blood cholesterol is so much easier to lower than emotional and social disruption. We need a better way, one that recognizes the power and importance of emotions that the heart, the metaphorical heart, was believed to house for millennia. Today, it is increasingly clear that chronic diseases like hypertension, coronary disease, and heart failure are linked to the state of our neighborhoods, jobs, families, and minds. To treat our hearts optimally will require intervention on all these fronts. This is much easier said than done, of course. Psychosocial repair is just as prone to unexpected consequences, difficult trade-offs, conflicting values, and diminishing returns as any medical treatment. But we will have to find ways, as Peter Sterling, the neurobiologist, put it, to, quote, reduce the need for vigilance and to restore small satisfactions, such as our contact with nature and with each other. For some, this will require city planning initiatives 
to encourage walking or bicycling, for example, instead of more sedentary lifestyles. Others will require fortification in more social realms, such as the enhancement of public life. For still others, cardiovascular benefits will come from more individual pursuits, such as meditation and stress reduction. Whatever the case, it is increasingly clear that the biological heart is inextricably linked to its metaphorical counterpart. Our mindset, our coping strategies, how we navigate challenging circumstances, our capacity to, to transcend distress, these things I have learned are also a matter of life and death. Thank you.